good evening and we all know that whenever the latest supreme court judgment comes especially in respect of under the succession rights for any vital aspects the one name which rings in our mind is that we should request mr s r surendran rao and he has always been kind enough and in fact we discuss in the office the grasp of mr rao to understand the subject also a voluminous the judgment will be he readily and willingly normally accepts to share his knowledge within the first week of that judgment taking cue from the latest supreme court judgment on behalf of beyond law clc we had requested mr s r surendran rao to share his legal perspectives and what does that judgment of the honorable supreme court lay down in succession rights of hindu children from void and voidable marriage being a sunday we know that everybody would like to move around but at the same time mr rao attracts everyone for his knowledge sharing over to you sir and we are indebted for accepting our invite thank you very much mr chatrat good evening everybody we are here today to find out the succession rights of children born out of void or voidable marriages see in order to understand the succession rights of these children normally called illegitimate children we should first understand what is a legitimate marriage and what is not a legitimate marriage in fact for that purpose a few sections of the hindu marriage act will have got to be carefully scrutinized along with a few provisions of the succession act in order to correctly understand the import of the latest judgment of the supreme court first we will have we look into section 5 of the hindu succession act Section five of the Hindu Succession Act lays down the conditions for a for a val valid Hindu marriage. A marriage may be solemnized between two Hindus if the following conditions are satisfied. So there are five conditions that are required to be satisfied in order to bring about a valid marriage. Neither party has a spouse living. at the time of the marriage so therefore the the, both the, the spouses should not have a, another spouse living at the time of the marriage that is the first thing the second thing is at the time of the marriage neither party is incapable of giving a valid consent to to it in consequence of unsoundness of mind or though capable of giving a valid consent has been suffering from mental disorder of such a kind or to such an extent as to be unfit for marriage and procreation of uh, children or has been subject to recurrent attacks of insanity this is number 2 number 3 the bridegroom has completed the age of 21 years the bride the age of 18 years at the time of the marriage then the third condition is fourth condition is the parties are not within the degrees of prohibited relationship unless the custom or usage governing each of them permit a marriage between the two so this is what is prohibited relationship is defined in section 3 uh, and we can go to section 3 to find out what what uh, what is prohibited relationship and what is not prohibited relationship then the fifth condition is that the parties uh, uh, are not suspicious of each other unless the custom or usage governing each of them permits of a marriage between the two so therefore the they should not be suspicious of each other what uh, when uh, when when does the two parties become suspicious again we'll have to go to the definition section the definition next section says that these persons will be suspicious and they cannot marry each other so in in fact under the old hindu law there were uh, 
Sapindas, Samanadakas, and Bandhus. Even in the Sapindas, there was what is called as Gotraja Sapindas and Binna Gotraja Sapindas also. In fact, there is no necessity to go into the world law at all because the what is Sapinda relationship is clearly defined in the definition section of the act itself. So, therefore, these are the five conditions required for a valid marriage. Then we, we should go to section seven. In section seven, the what are the ceremonies uh, uh, that, that have to be performed in a valid marriage are contained in section seven. I read section seven. A Hindu marriage may be solemnized. In fact, the word solemnized is a very important uh, uh, phrase that we have got to keep in mind while uh, referring to the other sections in the act. A Hindu marriage may be solemnized in accordance with the customary rites and ceremonies of either party there too. So it depends upon the custom of the parties. That is number one. Number two, where such rites and ceremonies include uh, the saptapadi, that is taking of the seven steps by the bridegroom and the bride jointly before the sacred five, the marriage becomes complete and binding when the seventh step uh, is taken. So, you, therefore, see, the, the saptapadi is the only thing that is referred to here. In fact, normally in, in, our, in South India, the essential ceremony is uh, one of tying the tali among the uh, among various uh, non brahmin communities so therefore in number of decisions the, the karnataka high court has said that if tying of the tali is proved that is sufficient proof of uh, uh, the ceremonies of the marriage having been solemnized now we go to section 11 section 11 speaks of uh, what marriages are void? What are void marriages? So, if uh, by a reference to section uh, uh, 5, if conditions, one, that is neither party has a uh, spouse living, or that the parties are within the degrees of prohibited relationship, or the parties are subindas of each other. Therefore, if uh, clauses 1, 5, 4 and 5, of section 5 are violated, those marriages are called void marriages. A void marriage is non est in law. Therefore, this is what they say. Any marriage solemnized after the commencement of this act shall be null and void and may on a petition presented by either party uh, thereto, again it's the other party, be declared by a decree of nullity. So, the, therefore, the decree is given a decree of nullity if it contravenes any one of the conditions contained in clauses 1, 4, 5 of subsection 5. So, these marriages are categorized as void marriages. Then, we should go to section 12. Section 12 deals with void marriages. This is what section 12 says. Any marriage solemnized, whether before or after commencement of this act, shall be void, shall be voidable, and may be annulled by a decree of nullity. So, therefore, the word the word used is nullity on any of the following grounds: uh, the impotency, uh, fraud, uh, concealment of information, and uh, so many other things are mentioned uh, in uh, section twelve. One thing we have to keep in mind that the parties to the marriage are uh, not aged 21 years or 18 years. And if there is a child marriage, in accordance with the terms of the Hindu Marriage Act, the marriage is not void. The marriage is only voidable. And unless set aside, it would by a decree of the court, by a decree of uh, nullity or annulment, the marriage continues to be valid. Now, in Madras, they, they have introduced a new uh, section, uh, which is Section 7A. This is applicable to 
only to the state of Madras. This is what is uh, uh, included by Section 7A by amending uh, the Hindu Marriage Act. So this is what the section says. This section shall apply to any marriage between two Hindus, whether uh, uh, Suyama Mariyatai marriage uh, or by any other name solemnized in the presence of relatives and friends uh, or other persons by each party to the marriage declaring in any language understood by the parties that each takes the other to be his wife as the case may be uh, her husband or by each party to the marriage garlanding the other or putting a ring upon the finger of the other or by tying uh, the, the, the tali. So therefore, the uh, essential ceremonies are given a go by uh, as far as Madras is concerned by introduction of Section 7A. All that is required is the husband and the wife must make a declaration that they are entering into a relationship in marriage, only one declaration. Then they can garland each other, they can exchange a ring, they can tie a tali. So this is all what is required. Therefore, the ceremonies, uh, uh, other ceremonies of the marriage are not required uh, uh, in, the, uh, in Madras state. And it is the only the Madras state that has in, introduced Section 7A. In fact, the uh, Section 7A was subject to a decision of the Supreme Court in a recent judgment reported in uh, uh, SLP criminal 6534 bar 2023. This decision is uh, 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 rendered on 28th August 23. In this decision, what happened was a marriage was solemnized uh, uh, in the presence of some advocates and other social workers. A certificate of marriage was also given. Then the, the wife probably was taken away by their parents. Therefore, a writ petition was filed before the High Court. A habeas corpus writ petition was filed by the High Court. The High Court uh, said that mere declaration is not sufficient. It should be made publicly if a public declaration is not made in the presence of a few people, mere declaration in the, in the uh, advocate's office in the presence of few persons and a certificate is given by the advocate would not su be sufficient compliance under Section 7A of, uh, the, uh, of the Hindu Marriage Act as in force in Madras state. So therefore, the High Court refused to grant any relief to the parties. The matter went up in appeal before the Supreme Court. In fact, the Supreme Court said that it is not necessary uh, uh, that, uh, the, that there should be uh, uh, a marriage uh, uh, with, uh, with a few per per persons in public and a declaration should be made before them. In fact, this is what the court has said uh, uh, in para 8 of the judgment. The, the view expressed by the Madras High Court in so-and-so, in the opinion of, the, of this court, is erroneous. It is premised on the assumption that every marriage requires a public solemnization or declaration. In the opinion of this court, in the opinion of this court, such a view is simplistic because often due to parental pressure uh, uh, among uh, kinship groups or caste or community institutions, couples intending to enter into a matrimony may not be able to, for the reason of such opposition, fold or give such a public declaration. Doing so would imperil their lives or could in the very least 
likely to result in danger to their bodily integrity or at worst a forceful or coerced separation of one from the other. It is not hard to visualize other brothers being brought uh, to bear upon the two individuals who are otherwise adults and have exercised their free will. To superimpose the condition of public declaration, which is absent in Section 7A in the opinion of the court, is not only narrowing the wide import of the statute, but also would be violative of the rights under Section, under Article 21 of the Constitution of India. This is what the court has said. In fact, there are reports, in fact, because this was a case where uh, uh, a marriage had taken place before uh, in an advocate's office, the, there were paper reports to say that marriages could be conducted in an advocate's uh, office also, and the advocates also can give certificate of marriage uh, as far as Madras is concerned. In fact, the paper reports are totally wrong. In fact, this is what the courts have said as far as the role of the advocates are concerned. In paragraph 9 of the judgment, this is what the Supreme Court has said. The court also notices the observations made in the impugned order with respect to role of advocates. The concern, the concern voiced by the High Court are not entirely unfounded. Advocate or, advocates or lawyers have many capacities, one being officers of the court. Therefore, this is what is important. Therefore, they should not, while acting as counsel or advocates, or, uh, or their capacity as advocates, undertake or volunteer to solemnize marriages. They can well result, that can well result in advocates, chambers, or officers turning out to be matrimonial establishments, a consequence never intended or perhaps never contemplated by law. However, in their capacity as friends or relatives of the intending spouses, they, uh, their role as witnesses cannot be ruled out. So therefore, this is what they said. So therefore, the paper reports in regard to this decision are uh, totally incorrect. And uh, it is not as if uh, um, marriages can be performed in the chambers of advocates. If they are related to the parties, they could be witnesses to the marriage, that's all, and nothing more than that. This is what the Supreme Court has said. So that is with regard to the uh, ceremonies of the marriage as far as Madras is concerned. Then the next most important decision is their succession rights for purpose of succession rights, we should go to section 16 of the Hindu Marriage Act. In fact, I would uh, make a reference to section uh, uh, 16, I'm not uh, section 16 of the Hindu Marriage Act. In fact, this section 16 of the Hindu Marriage Act, uh, as it originally stood, there were uh, uh, a, a provision which said, that where a marriage is declared void under section 11 by the, by a court by a competent court or where a marriage is annulled in respect of a voidable marriage under section 12 then the children born out of such marriage would be on par with legitimate children and they would succeed to the property of their parents only. This was what was contained in section 16 as it should earlier. In the year 1976, this 16 was amended. And now the section 16 says that uh, legitimacy of children of void and voidable marriages, notwithstanding that the marriage is null and void under section 11. In fact, reference to a decree of the court is taken away now. And mar uh, Section 11, any child of such marriage who would have been legitimate if the marriage had been valid shall be, legit shall be legitimate whether such child is born before or after 
the commencement of the marriage laws amendment act 1976 and whether or not a decree of nullity is granted in respect of the marriage under the act and whether or not the marriage is held to be otherwise uh, void otherwise than on a petition under this act where a decree of nullity is granted in respect of a voidable marriage under section 12 any child begotten or conceived before the decree is made who would have been the legitimate child of the parties to the marriage if at the date of the marriage it had been dissolved instead of being annulled shall be deemed to be the uh, le legitimate child notwithstanding the decree of nullity then nothing contained in subsection 1 or subsection 2 shall be construed as conferring upon the child of the marriage which is null and void or which is annulled by a decree of nullity under section 12 any rights in or to the property of any person other than the parents what is they they would, they would not be entitled to uh, uh, any property on succession uh, other than their parents other than their parent that is the emphasis in any case where but for passing of the act such child would have been incapable of possessing or acquiring any such rights by reason of his not being the legitimate child of his parents so therefore a marriage may be void or voidable if children are born out of such marriages they are presumed to be legitimate though uh, in the absence of this particular section they would have been uh, illegitimate so therefore and they are entitled to only the property of their parents and not anybody else this is the emphasis contained in this section in fact the old section which contained a reference to a decree of uh, 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 nullity or a decree of annulment of uh, the marriage by a court is deleted uh, in the in the amended portion in the amended uh, section w only because the uh, the section as it stood earlier was held to be unconstitutional as violate of article 14 of the constitution of india so therefore this this it is in fact i would uh, uh, demonstrate as to what the section actually means is that uh, if you uh, if there, there are, let us suppose there are four brothers that is c1 c2 c3 and c4 amongst them the c2 the second brother is dead let us suppose he has two wives one wife and he has taken a second wife during the lifetime of the first wife so therefore naturally the second marriage is a void marriage so therefore he has a son and a daughter by the first marriage which is a valid marriage a son and a daughter by the second marriage which is an invalid marriage and uh, those children are uh, considered to be legitimate by virtue of the provisions of uh, Uh, section uh, uh, 16 of the hindu marriage act now what what happens is let us suppose c2 dies on the day when c2 died he had a one fourth share in the in this properties because he had three other brothers so when c2 dies the the two children by the first wife they would be that is s1 and d1 they would be co-partners along with uh, uh, the father at the time of his death because of vinita sharma's case so therefore this one fourth share of the father would be divided between the father the son and the daughter by the first wife who are legitimate because the first marriage is a valid marriage so therefore this one fourth share would be shared by all the three persons and therefore 
each of them get a one twelfth share each, and the the remaining one twelfth share of the father, that would be divided between the wife who is alive, that is one wife who is alive, and also the uh, the one wife who is that is the first wife only because the second wife will not get a uh, right. Uh, if there are two wives, both the wives take the uh, share together. Then the the wife and the four children, they share the one twelfth share of the father, and therefore all these five persons they get a one sixtieth share. Therefore, the legitimate child from the first marriage gets a one twelve one twelfth share, that is by right by birth. Plus one sixteenth share on succession to their father, so that and the illegitimate children by the first wife, they get one sixteenth share only because they don't take the share of uh, uh, share in the joint family properties as co-partners. They don't become co-partners. The illegitimate children, they don't become co-partners. they only take the property on succession to the father so therefore their rights in the co-partnership property gets limited to a 160th share only whereas the legitimate children get a 112 share plus 160th share this is all, this is all what the supreme court has said <coughs> in a decision rendered uh, recently now we can uh, go to this decision of the supreme court i make a reference to a few paragraphs in the decision of the supreme court we, we may make a reference to this uh, civil appeal we may make a note of this uh, decision because it is not yet reported civil appeal number 2844 bar 2011 revanna siddappa and another Versus Malika Arjun and others. This decision is rendered on first of September, twenty twenty-three. In fact, the, the earlier decisions were: see, they are entitled to a share in the property of their parents. So, therefore, there were decisions by various courts in this country which said that. this property of their parents would mean property which belong to the parents as their self acquired property particularly the father and the it would not include the share of the father in the in the co-partnership properties and it would embrace only the properties which belong to the father exclusively therefore some doubts were expressed in in this regard by a bench of two judges the matter was referred to a three member bench and uh, the leading decision in this case was rendered by justice y v chandrachur now i would uh, like to make a reference to few paragraphs in this judgment in fact the question involved in this judgment is uh, 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 clearly spelt out in a few paragraphs to the judgment which i would read for your consideration then uh, what what section 16 actually 3 of the hindu marriage act actually means is set out in paragraph 16 of the judgment subsection 3 of section 16 commences with a non obstinate provision uh, con contained in subsection 1 and subsection 2 parliament while enacting subsection 3 intends to ensure that the legislative conferment of legitimacy will not confer upon such a child born from a void or voidable marriage as the case may be any rights in or to the property of any person other than the parents where but for passing of the legislation the child 
would have been incapable of possessing or acquiring any such rights by reason of their not being the legitimate, legitimate child of the parents. There are two crucial expressions in subsection 3. The first is any right in or to the property of any person other than the parents. The second is where, but for the passing of the stack, such child would have been incapable of possessing or acquiring any such rights by reason of his not being the legitimate child of the parents. Subsection 3, in other words, circumscribes the consequence of the legitimate legislative protection of, of the legitimacy of the child in relation to the conferment of rights in the property. In fact, subsequently after a few lines, but the provision equally indicates that the conferment of legitimacy will not operate to confer rights in or to the property of persons who are not the parents of the child. So therefore, they don't get anything from any person other than their parents by succession. Then, what was the issue involved in this case is put in paragraph 17 of the judgment. The reference essentially raises the following issue, following issue. Whether a child who is conferred with legitimacy, the child would have been otherwise illegitimate. The, the, the legislature confers legitimacy, legitimacy to such children. <clears throat> a child who is conferred with legislative legitimacy under section 16.1 or 16.2 is by reason of section 16.3 entitled to ancestral or co property of the parents or is the child merely entitled to the self earned bar separate property of the parents. The question that arises before us first, whether the legislative intent is to confer legitimacy on a child covered by section 16 in a manner that makes them co-partners and thus entitled to initiate or get a share in the partition actual or notion. Second, at what point does a specific property transition into becoming the property of the parent? For, for it, for it is solely within such property that children endowed with legitimacy would be entitled in order uh, in, uh, in accordance with section 16.3. So therefore, this was the question before the court and uh, various uh, the court after having uh, the, then uh, uh, imp the sub uh, we may uh, go to uh, paragraph 28 of the judgment. Paragraph 28. They make a reference to this uh, Guru Padappa Kandappa versus Hira Bai Kandappa Magadam. That is the famous case uh, where the concept of notional partition has been very clearly uh, expounded by the senior Chandra Chod, the father of uh, the present Chief Justice of India. In fact, there is an often quoted decision. The decision is quoted with approval. And uh, after making a reference uh, to this decision at paragraph uh, 28, we may go to paragraph uh, 33, page, page 33 at, and para 33 of the judgment. So then for, they try to connect 16.3 with section 6 to find out whether they would be entitled to any rights, the illegitimate children would be entitled to any rights uh, in the co properties by birth. Before the amendment, section 6 provided that on the death of a male Hindu, his interest in Mitakshara co property would devolve by survivorship upon the surviving members of the co and not in accordance with the mode of succession pro provided in the Act. Section 6.3 of the amended provision now stipulates that a Hindu dying after the commencement of the amending act, his interest in the property of joint Hindu family governed by Mitakshara law devolves by testamentary or interstate succession 
as the case may be under the act and not by survivorship so therefore under the amended section the uh, concept of uh, uh, the notion the concept of survivorship is taken away what it says is the uh, uh, whatever share the father is entitled to at the time of the birth is worked out at a notional partition and whatever the father gets that fraction of a share would go by uh, testamentary or interstate succession so therefore the whatever the father gets at a notional partition just prior to his death would be his uh, would partake the character of self acquired property and therefore the illegitimate children or the children from void or voidable marriages they don't become copartners therefore they don't get any right by birth in the copartnery properties all that they are entitled to is the share which the father gets at a notional partition would become his exclusive property therefore they get a right by succession in the property uh, to which the father becomes entitled to at this notional partition this uh, uh, difference will have got to be clearly kept in mind therefore the legitimate children get a right by birth in the copartnery properties and therefore they take a share as copartners and also a share on succession to the father whereas the illegitimate child does not get the share uh, as of right they only get a share by virtue of the death of the father in the share to which he was entitled to at the time of his death so therefore see the concept of uh, obstructed heritage and unobstructed heritage will have got to be kept in mind the legitimate children would be entitled to these properties both by obstructed heritage and also by unobstructed heritage whereas the children by the void by void or voidable marriages they get a property by un uh, obstructed heritage only and not unobstructed heritage suppose the father wants to deprive the children uh, illegitimate children of any share in the copartnery properties or his self acquired properties he can certainly do it by executing a will as far as legitimate children are concerned he can deprive them of a share in his share only but he cannot deprive them of a share in the share which they get by birth in those in the in, in those properties so this is what uh, the supreme court has said uh, at paragraph uh, 36 of the uh, judgment i read from paragraph 36 the explanation to subsection 3 mandates that the interest of a hindu mitakshara copartner would be ascertained on the basis of a partition that takes place of the property immediately before the is death the in, the his interest is deemed to be the share in the property which would have been allotted in a partition at a point of time immediately before the death irrespective or not irrespective of whether or not he was entitled to seek a partition in fact the illegitimate children have no right to file a suit and ask for a partition during the lifetime of the father whereas the legitimate children they have a right by birth in the ancestral copartnery properties and they can certainly file a suit for partition now we uh, we may go to Uh, page 35 <clears throat> see what is uh, the property of the parents is discussed at uh, 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 paragraph 42 of the judgment and, uh, and uh, this is what uh, Uh, the supreme court has said when a hindu dies 
after the commencement of the amending act 2005 his interest in the property of the joint family governed by mitakshara law has to devolve by testamentary or interstate succession and not by survivorship as stipulated in subsection 3 of section 6 the interest of a hindu mitakshara co-partner for purpose of subsection 3 has to be ascertained on the basis that a notional partition has taken place immediately before the death the distribution of the property among class 1 years is governed by rules specified in section 10 then we may go to the end of this paragraph hence hence where uh, the deceased has died intestate the devolution of his of this property must be among the children legitimate as well as those conferred with legitimacy by the legislature under section 161 and 162 of the hindu marriage act doing so would not offend or breach the restrictions contained in subsection 3 of section 16 section 6 then the the court gives an illustration similar to the one which i have given but i have given the an, an extended uh, 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 illustration and uh, uh, the, the, the this illustration uh, is referred to in paragraph 43 of the judgment because i have given that uh, illustration already i do not make a reference to it now i make a reference to paragraph 44 of the judgment we must clarify that it is true that the hindu law recognizes a branch of the family as a subordinate corporate entity within the fold of a larger corporationary con- consisting comprising of many branches however even such a branch can acquire fold and dispose of family property subject to certain limitations the nature of property held by such a branch until partitioned among the members of the branch does not cease to be joint family of all the co-partners with the bank now since the child conferred with legitimacy under section 16 is not a co-partner the branch comprises the father and his children born out of valid marriage as such the property once partitioned from the low, larger co-partnery and in the hands of the father for his own branch He is not the father's separate property. The one fourth share of the father in the illustration given would not be separate property. It continues to be the co-partnery property in which the children from the valid marriage have joint ownership. Only from valid marriage they have joint ownership. Thus, in view of the restriction in section sixteen three in uh, in this uh, p- property. not being the exclusive property of the father a child covered under section 161 and 162 is not is not entitled is not entitled the above legal position is supported by a conjoint reading of section 6 of the hindu succession act and section 16 of the hindu marriage act then uh, then uh, uh, the uh, illustra- uh, the the law is further explained in paragraph 45 the individual upon whom legitimacy has been conferred under section 161 or 162 of the hindu hindu marriage act would be entitled to the property that would have been allotted to their parent assuming a notional partition immediately before the death of the parent such a construction would be in accordance with section 63 and would harmonize with the provisions of section 163 of the hindu marriage act now the now i think we can go to uh, para para 50 at page 46 of the judgment legitimacy and co-partnery see what is most important is in this para it is very clearly stated that the children born out of a marriage which is either void or voidable they don't become co-partners that is stated in uh, one sentence in this such an individual 
सच एन इंडिविजुअल डज नॉट इप्सो फैक्टो बिकेम ए को पार्सनर इन दिंदू मिताक्षरा जॉइंट फैमिली section 16 however continues to recognize the ex existence of mitakshara uh, hindu joint family therefore uh, the, 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 this has got to be very clearly kept in mind they don't become co-partners they be, they are entitled to the right in the co-partnership property which is allotted to the father at the time of death in the nostral partition they don't get any right by birth they only get a share in the share of the father like uh, like a, a widow of uh, the deceased and nothing more than that and uh, uh, the father can deprive the illegitimate children of any rights in the in the in the in these properties then uh, uh, <coughs> the, i may make a reference to Uh, uh, the end of uh, 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 the end at page forty-eight of the judgment, section sixteen three, represents a balancing act by the legislature when it stipulates that a child who is legitimate in terms of subsection one or section two of section sixteen would have rights in or to the property only of the parents and not to any other person. So therefore. See, they would not succeed to the uh, brothers of the father, the collaterals. They would not succeed to even to the property of uh, uh, their step brother or sister in certain situations and all that. I would uh, uh, further extend the the illustration which I have already given. So therefore, this second brother C dies after the death of C, as I have already said. the two children by the first wife who are legitimate they get a one twelfth share by birth and one fortieth uh, share that is the in the share of the father by succession and uh, one not one forty one one sixtieth share by succession to the father so suppose the daughter dies the legitimate daughter dies then and she dies issueless if the legitimate daughter dies issueless then what happens is under section 152 the property reverts to the heirs of the father so when the property reverts to the heirs of the father the property is succeeded by the other brother only because the property does not belong to the parents the 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 son by the first wife alone succeeds to the property of the sisters and the step son or step sister they do not get any right in these properties suppose the uncle dies without issues and under uh, uh, class 2 years would be brother's children let us suppose so if the brother's children are class 2 years only the sons the legitimate sons of the brother by the first wife would be entitled to the illegitimate children would not be entitled to any of these properties and the word used in section 16 is that a, a marriage which is solemnized so therefore the second marriage must be accompanied by ceremonies as stated in section 7 if there are no ceremonies if a man just lives with another wife let us suppose that he has Uh, a living relationship with a lady he has a first wife he has a living relationship with the second wife second not the second wife with another lady then she does not get the status of a second wife in law because the marriage is not solemnized therefore the children of the even if both of them are hindus if they live if there is a uh, uh, living relationship between them the children of this living relationship of these two hindus they do not become legitimate in accordance with section 16 3 because section 16 refers to marriage as solemnized and not otherwise there is all in fact the in fact uh, many times it happens that the father has a wife and he has a concubine the children of the concubine 
they don't become legitimate children they continue to be illegitimate children only because the marriage with the concubine is not solemnized so therefore the the provisions of section 163 applies only when the marriage is solemnized and not otherwise so therefore the uh, the law will have got to be clearly kept in mind if uh, the father in a, to put it in a nutshell if the father owns uh, co personal property and also self acquired property as far as self acquired properties are concerned there is no difficulty both legitimate and illegitimate children they get equal shares the problem arises only in regard to the co personal or joint family properties in the co personal or joint family properties the legitimate son takes in two capacities one as a as a son by uh, a right by birth and as a son on succession to the father in both capacities he gets the property whereas an illegitimate son does not get any right by birth as a co-partner he only gets a right on succession to the father uh, in the share that the father gets at a notional partition this has got to be very clearly kept in mind and the law will have got to be understood as far as the property of the mother is concerned there is no difficulty at all see succession to the property of a female is governed by section 15 if she dies under section 15 1 the property goes to the son daughter and the husband and and the, and the husband so therefore the word son or daughter it does not include a step son or a step daughter therefore if the first wife dies the property goes only to the children of the first wife if the second wife dies the property goes only to the children of the second wife so therefore the step children do not inherit the property of the step mother and this fact also will have got to be clearly kept in mind so therefore i have just tried to explain the this uh, the two decisions of the supreme court one under section 7a of the tamil nadu amendment to section 7 of the hindu marriage act and the and the latest decision of the supreme court in uh, revanna siddappa's case therefore i only hope that i have made myself clear and uh, if you have any questions you can ask me and i'll try to reply the questions that may be asked always clear it is only that you have made the people clearer ah <laughs> yes sir so uh, one of the question is is it prospective or retrospective according to you see see this the the law if the death of the father takes place after the advent of the hindu marriage act then uh, for all such uh, uh, cases uh, section 163 applies and therefore the, the law laid down by supreme court also applies so therefore the death, death must take place after 19 uh, after the hindu marriage act then only these provisions would apply and not otherwise then this is by anand when a marriage is void does it make any difference if it is it was solemnized or not solemnized see sec, if, by uh, reading a section in in fact at the cost of repetition i would make a reference to section 16 again wherein the word used in section 16 is this not with standing that the marriage is null and void under section 11 uh, then yeah, if you so therefore the marriage must be void under section 11 or voidable under section 12 in both section 11 and section 12 the reference is to the marriage any marriage solemnized after the commencement of this act that those are the opening words of section 11 in voidable marriage is any marriage solemnized whether before or after the commencement of the act so therefore for application of section 11 or 12 there must the 
ceremony is for the marriage must be there the marriage must be solemnized then only either it would be a void or voidable marriage any other if there are no ceremonies at all there is no marriage at all it is, it is as if they are not husband and wife the relationship is not sanctioned by law they by virtue of uh, uh, article 21 them they might not have committed any offense but uh, their marriage is not recognized and they would not be entitled to succeed either under 6 or under section 15 of the hindu succession act says what will be the right of the children who are born without marriage this you have already clarified uh, that they are they are they don't get anything on succession in fact if the father wants or if the uh, mother wants uh, the anyway mother mother's property will go there is no problem as far as the father's property is concerned if he wants he can give it by will or by a gift but by succession the children will not get anything and what about in certain cases especially in the service side they say that the divorce was by a customary divorce whether the children of the second uh, wife But there is no proof that there is a marriage, living relationship. Whether that they would get the pension or other benefits. See, we are dealing with the question of succession. See, and uh, the word used is property of the parents. If it becomes, if the pensionary benefits become the property of the father, then they would be entitled to a share. If it does not become the property of the father. they would not be entitled to a share according to me the pensionary benefits of the father would certainly be the property of the father and both children legitimate and illegitimate would be entitled to a equal share according to me in fact if the marriage is not solemnized as required under section uh, 7 then uh, the hind the the these prov the provisions of section 163 has no application at all and so thank you for sharing your knowledge uh, though i would not be able to understand but since lot of viewers are from uh, karnataka they said that if mr rao could just explain in 10 minutes in kannada though would, it will be total greek to me you want me to speak in kannada some a lot of people have posted in the right, chat box I, so you can I, give I, us I, something in 10 minutes yes i will do it in kannada there is no problem ee revanna siddappa case nalli mukhyavagi supreme court nor yen helidare andre ee eradane madaveyinda puttida makkalu they would be normally illegitimate children so a void or voidable marriage alli puttida makkalige they are given the status of legitimate children under section 163 they, they they are conferred with legitimacy by virtue of section 163 so adrinda avaru kuda legitimate children anta pariganisalagutade adre Section 16.3 of the Hindu Marriage Act Prakara, Tandege Serida Asti Ali Matra, E. Wide or Widable Marriage Ali Hutti the Makalege, Hakirate, and the Section 16.3 Helte. Adrinda, Supreme Court in Helida Rendere, E. Iburu Makulu, E. Makali Aru, Yerdane Madbe in the Atwa Widable Marriage in the Hutitare. ಅವರಿಗೆ ಅವರು ಕೋಪಾರ್ಸ್ನರ್ಸ್ ಆಗೋದಿಲ್ಲ ಮಿತಾಕ್ಷರ ಜಾಯಿಂಟ್ ಫ್ಯಾಮಿಲಿ ಅವರಿಗೆ ತಂದೆ ಭಾಗ ಏನು ಬರುತ್ತೋ ಆ ಭಾಗದಲ್ಲಿ ಬರ್ತಕ್ಕಂಥ ಆಸ್ತಿಯಲ್ಲಿ ಮಾತ್ರ ಭಾಗ ಬರುತ್ತೆ ತಂದೆ ಸ್ವಯಾದ್ಯತ ಆಸ್ತಿಯಲ್ಲಿ ಏನು ತೊಂದರೆ ಇಲ್ಲ ಲೆಜಿಟಿಮೇಟ್ ಚಿಲ್ಡ್ರನ್ ಇಲೆಜಿಟಿಮೇಟ್ ಚಿಲ್ಡ್ರನ್ ಎಲ್ರಿಗೂ ಸಮಭಾಗ ಬರುತ್ತೆ ತಂದೆ ಲೆಜಿಟಿಮೇಟ್ ಚಿಲ್ಡ್ರನ್ ಆದರೆ ಈ ಆನ್ಸೆಸ್ಟ್ರಲ್ ಕೋಪಾರ್ಸ್ನರಿ ಪ್ರಾಪರ್ಟೀಸ್ ಅಲ್ಲಿ ಅವರಿಗೆ ಜನ್ಮ ಸಿದ್ಧ ಹಕ್ಕು ಬರುತ್ತೆ ಅವರಿಗೆ ತಂದೆ ಮೇಲೆ ಒಂದು ಪಾರ್ಟಿಷನ್ ಸೂಟ್ ಹಾಕಿ ತಂದೆಯಿಂದ ಆಸ್ತಿಯಲ್ಲಿ ಭಾಗ ತಗೋಬಹುದು ತಂದೆ ಬದುಕಿದ್ದಾಗ ಆದರೆ ಈ 
ವಾಯ್ಡ್ ಆರ್ ವಾಯ್ಡಬಲ್ ಮ್ಯಾರೇಜಸ್ ಹುಟ್ಟಿರೋ ಮಕ್ಕಳಿಗೆ ಕಾನೂನು ಪ್ರಕಾರ ರಜಿಟಿ ಬೇಸಿ ಕೊಟ್ಟಿರ್ತೇವೆ ಆದ್ರಿಂದ ಅವರು ಕೋಪಾರ್ಸ್ನರ್ಸ್ ಆಗೋದಿಲ್ಲ ತಂದೆ ಬದುಕಿರೋ ತನಕ ಅವ್ರು ಯಾವ ಆಸ್ತಿಯಲ್ಲೂ ಏನು ಶೇರ್ ಕೇಳಕ್ ಆಗೋದಿಲ್ಲ ತಂದೆಗೆ ಸ್ವಯಾರ್ಜಿತ ಆಸ್ತಿಗಳಲ್ಲಿ ತಂದೆಗೆ ಅವನು ಸಾಯಕ್ ಮುಂಚೆ ಒಂದು ಪಾರ್ಟಿಷನ್ ಆಗಿದೆ ಅಂತ ಭಾವಿಸಿ ಅಂಥ ಪಾರ್ಟಿಷನ್ ನಲ್ಲಿ ತಂದೆ ಭಾಗಕ್ಕೆ ಏನು ಆಸ್ತಿ ಬರುತ್ತೋ ಅದು ತಂದೆ ಸ್ವಯಾರ್ಜಿತ ಆಸ್ತಿ ಅಂತ ಪರಿಗಣಿಸಲಾಗುತ್ತೆ ಆದ್ರಿಂದ ಈ ಇಲ್ಲೆಜಿಟಿಮೇಟ್ ಚಿಲ್ಡ್ರನ್ ಏನಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಅವರಿಗೆ ಈ ತಂದೆ ಭಾಗದಲ್ಲಿ ಒಂದು ಶೇರ್ ಬರುತ್ತೆ ಹೊರತಾಗಿ ತಂದೆಯ ಪಿತ್ರಾರ್ಜಿತ ಆಸ್ತಿಗಳಲ್ಲಿ ಜನ್ಮಸಿದ್ದ ಹಕ್ಕು ಏನಿರೋದಿಲ್ಲ ಲೆಜಿಟಿಮೇಟ್ ಚಿಲ್ಡ್ರನ್ಗೆ ಜನ್ಮಸಿದ್ದ ಹಕ್ಕು ಇರುತ್ತೆ ತಂದೆಯಿಂದ ಭಾಗ ತಂದೆ ಸತ್ ಮೇಲೆ ಅವ್ರ ಭಾಗದಲ್ಲಿ ಭಾಗನೂ ಬರುತ್ತೆ ಆದ್ರೆ ಇಲ್ಲೆಜಿಟಿಮೇಟ್ ಚಿಲ್ಡ್ರನ್ಗೆ ತಂದೆ ಸತ್ ಮೇಲೆ ತಂದೆ ಆಸ್ತಿಯಲ್ಲಿ ಮಗ ಭಾಗ ಮಾತ್ರ ಭಾಗ ಬರುತ್ತೆ ನಾನು ಅದಕ್ಕೆ ಒಂದು ಇಲ್ಯುಸ್ಟ್ರೇಷನ್ ಕೊಟ್ಟೆ ಒಂದು ಒಬ್ಬ ನಾಲ್ಕು ಜನ ಗಂಡು ಬಕ್ಳಿದ್ದಾರೆ ನಾಲ್ಕು ಜನ ಕೋಪಾರ್ಸ್ ಧರ್ಸು ಎಲ್ರಿಗೂ ನಾಲ್ಕನೇ ಒಂದು ಭಾಗ ಇರುತ್ತೆ ಮೊದಲನೇ ತಂದೆಗೆ ಇಬ್ ಇಬ್ಬ ಹಿಂಡೂ ಮ್ಯಾರೇಜ್ ಆಕ್ಟ್ ಬಂದ ಮೇಲೆ ಎರಡು ಮದುವೆ ಮಾಡ್ಕೊಂಡಿರ್ತಾನೆ ಒಂದ ಮೊದಲನೇ ಹೆಂಡತಿ ಬದುಕಿರುವಾಗಲೇ ಎರಡನೇ ಮದುವೆ ಮಾಡ್ಕೊಂಡಿರ್ತಾನೆ ಆ ಸನ್ನಿವೇಶದಲ್ಲಿ ಏನಾಗ ಏನಾಗುತ್ತೆ ಅಂದ್ರೆ ಎರಡನೇ ಮದುವೆ ವೈಡ್ ಮ್ಯಾರೇಜು ಅವನಿಗೆ ಮೊದಲನೇ ಮದುವೆಯಿಂದ ಒಬ್ಬ ಮಗ ಮಗಳು ಇರ್ತಾರೆ ಎರಡನೇ ಮದುವೆಯಿಂದನೂ ಒಬ್ಬ ಮಗ ಮಗಳು ಇರ್ತಾರೆ ಮೊದಲನೇ ಮದುವೆಯಿಂದ ಬಂದಿರುವ ಮಗ ಮಗ ಮಗಳಿಗೆ ವಿನೀತಾ ಶರ್ಮಾ ಕೇಸ್ ಪ್ರಕಾರ ಆ ಮಗ ಮಗಳಿಬ್ರು ಕೂಡ ಕೋಪಾರ್ ಸರ್ಸಾಕ್ತಾರೆ ಆದ್ರೆ ತಂದೆ ಒಂದ್ ನಾಲ್ಕನೇ ಒಂದ್ ಭಾಗದಲ್ಲಿ ಈ ಮಗ ಮತ್ತು ಮಗಳಿಗೆ ಇಬ್ಬರಿಗೂ ಕೂಡ ಸ ತಂದೆ ಸಮಾನವಾದ ಹಕ್ಕು ಬರುತ್ತೆ ತಂದೆಗೆ ಒಂದು ಒಂದನೇ ಹನ್ನ ಹನ್ನೆರಡನೇ ಒಂದು ಭಾಗ ಈ ಮ ಮೊದಲನೇ ಹೆಂಡತಿ ಮಗ ಮಗಳಿಗೂ ಕೂಡ ಹನ್ನ ಹನ್ನೆರಡನೇ ಒಂದು ಭಾಗ ಹನ್ನೆರಡನೇ ಒಂದು ಭಾಗ ಬರುತ್ತೆ ಆದರೆ ಈ ತಂದೆಗೆ ಬಂದಿರೋ ಹನ್ನೆರಡು ಹನ್ನೆರಡನೇ ಒಂದು ಭಾಗ ಏನಿದೆ ಹನ್ನೆರಡರಲ್ಲಿ ಒಂದು ಭಾಗ ಏನಿದೆ ಅದು ತಿರುಗಿ ಅವನ ಹೆಂಡತಿ ನಾಲ್ಕು ಜನ ಮಕ್ಕಳಿಗೆ ಭಾಗ ಆಗುತ್ತೆ ಅದು ಒನ್ ಓವರ್ ಸಿಕ್ಸ್ಟಿ ಅದು ಶೇರ್ ಆಗುತ್ತೆ ಆದ್ರಿಂದ ಮೊದಲನೇ ಹೆಂಡತಿ ಮಕ್ಕಳಿಗೆ ನಾ ಒಂದೇ ಹನ್ನೆರಡು ಭಾಗ ಪ್ಲಸ್ ಒಂದೇ ಅರವತ್ತು ಭಾಗ ಅರವತ್ತರಲ್ಲಿ ಒಂದು ಭಾಗ ಬರುತ್ತೆ ಆದ್ರೆ ಎರಡನೇ ಹೆಂಡತಿ ಮಕ್ಕಳಿಗೆ ಅರವತ್ತನೇ ಅರವತ್ತಲ್ಲಿ ಒಂದು ಭಾಗ ಬರುತ್ತೆ ಹೊರತಾಗಿ ಅವರಿಗೆ ಜನ್ಮಸಿದ್ದ ಹಕ್ಕನಿಂದ ಅವ್ರಿಗೆ ಏನ್ ಬರೋದಿಲ್ಲ ಅದರಿಂದ ಇದು ದಿಸ್ ಈಸ್ ದಿ ಎಂಟೈರ್ಲಿ ವಾಟ್ ದಿ ಸುಪ್ರೀಂ ಕೋರ್ಟ್ ಅಸೆಟ್ ಆ ತಂದೆಗೆ ನೋಷನಲ್ ಪಾರ್ಟಿಷನ್ ಅಲ್ಲಿ ಏನ್ ಭಾಗ ಬರುತ್ತೋ ಅದ್ರಲ್ಲಿ ಮಾತ್ರ ಇಲ್ಲೇ ಚಿಟ್ಮೇಟ್ ಚಿಲ್ಡ್ರನ್ ಬರುತ್ತೆ ತಂದೆ ಸ್ವಯಾರ್ಜಿತ ಆಸ್ತಿಯಲ್ಲಿ ಬರುತ್ತೆ ತಾಯಿಯ ಆಸ್ತಿ ವಿಷಯದಲ್ಲಿ ಏನ್ ತೊಂದರೆ ಇಲ್ಲ ಮೊದಲನೇ ಹೆಂಡತಿ ಸತ್ತು ಹೋದ್ರೆ ಮೊದಲನೇ ಹೆಂಡತಿ ಮಕ್ಕಳಿಗೆ ಮಾತ್ರ ಬರುತ್ತೆ ಎರಡನೇ ಹೆಂಡತಿ ಸತ್ತು ಹೋದ್ರೆ ಎರಡನೇ ಹೆಂಡತಿ ಮಕ್ಕಳಿಗೆ ಮಾತ್ರ ಬರುತ್ತೆ ಮೊದಲನೇ ಹೆಂಡತಿ ಸತ್ತು ಹೋದ್ರೆ ಎರಡನೇ ಹೆಂಡತಿ ಮಕ್ಕಳಿಗೆ ಬರಲ್ಲ ಎರಡನೇ ಹೆಂಡತಿ ಸತ್ತು ಹೋದ್ರೆ ಮೊದಲನೇ ಹೆಂಡತಿ ಮಕ್ಕಳಿಗೆ ಬರಲ್ಲ ಇದು ಇಷ್ಟೇ ಕಾನೂನಿನ ಮುಖ್ಯವಾದ ಅಂಶಗಳು ಅದರಿಂದ ಮದುವೆ ಮದುವೆ ಆಗದೆ ಇವಾಗ ಒಂದು ತಂದೆ ಸೆರ್ಮೊನೀಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಮ್ಯಾರೇಜ್ ಸೆಕ್ಷನ್ ಸೆವೆನ್ ಪ್ರಕಾರ ಅವನು ಮದುವೆ ಮಾಡ್ಕೊಂಡಿದ್ರೆ ಒಂದನೇ ಮದುವೆ ಎರಡನೇ ಮದುವೆ ಅಂತ ಆಗುತ್ತೆ ಸಪೋಸ್ ತಂದೆ ಮದುವೆ ಮಾಡ್ಕೊಳ್ದೆ ಹಿಂದೆ ಹೇಳ್ತೇ ಒಬ್ಬ ಕಾನ್ ಕ್ಯೂಬೈನ ಅವನು ಇಟ್ಕೊಂಡು ಅವಳಿಂದ ಅವನಿಗೆ ಮಕ್ಕಳು ಹುಟ್ಟಿದ್ರೆ ದೋಸ್ ಚಿಲ್ಡ್ರನ್ ವಿಲ್ ಬಿ ಇಲೆಜಿಟಿಮೇಟ್ ದೇ ವಿಲ್ ನಾಟ್ ಬಿಕಮ್ ಲೆಜಿಟಿಮೇಟ್ ಚಿಲ್ಡ್ರನ್ ಎರಡನೇ ಸೆರ್ಮನೀಸ್ ಮಾಡಿಕೊಂಡು ಎರಡನೇ ಮದುವೆ ಮಾಡ್ಕೊಂಡಿದ್ದ ಪಕ್ಷದಲ್ಲಿ ಮಾತ್ರ
see if the, if the property is coparsonary property and uh, if the suit is filed subsequent to the 2005 amendment the daughter would get a share as a coparsoner if the father if there are father and two sons one third share each she gets and in the in the father share also it is again shared and that that goes to his wife and also two children so therefore the daughter also gets in two capacities if there is no question of illegitimacy is involved the daughter the, the daughter and the son both are on par with each other and the daughter also gets an equal share with the son in such a situation yeah thank you sir for sharing your knowledge and like any other uh, audience we will also wait uh, for the topic from you thank you everyone for joining us and uh, thank you to sir for your indomitable spirit to keep on sharing the knowledge with us thank you thank you